uh, before we start. So um, to any of you that are here, yeah, as you're doing there already, Sindhu, um, and Alan, let us know where you are. It'd be nice to know where you are as well. Pop that into the chat. That'd be great. I had a killer opening question as well. I was going to ask you all to uh, provide a recommendation for something to watch on TV, the genre, and then a one sentence about what it is to entice us. So we'd all get loads of really good recommendations um because you've probably exhausted netflix and amazon like i have and uh you know need some other slightly weirder stuff that you might not ordinarily watch perhaps uh great so um let me just check are we recording now james yeah we recording started so that is wonderful um so uh welcome everybody to the session uh today um so we're with the uh, wonderful uh dr Hannah Gore, who I will be uh, introducing uh, just shortly. A little bit of housekeeping, uh, first of all. So um, I can see you've all found the chat uh, panel, which is great. We've got a ton of you in today. Uh, Hannah's session is going to generate loads of chat, loads of discussion. Uh, what we'll need to do periodically is clear the chat out. Now, don't worry, uh, comments won't be lost. You'll see them in the recording, um, and we'll, we'll have a separate uh, record of those as well. That's just to keep Adobe Connect uh, running nicely. Uh, when we move on to um, uh, when Hannah's presenting, you'll also see a panel down below her presentation. So I'm sure you've been to lots of the sessions before, but what we want to use that panel for is capturing all of your great questions, because uh, otherwise they can get lost in the chat. So please post your, uh, your questions there. Um, so a shout out to our sponsor of the day, uh, which is Thrive Learning. Um, and to let you know how we'll handle those questions. So uh, Hannah's going to present for around 20, 25 minutes. Um, and then we're going to have a big uh, Q&A session at the end. So you have lots of time uh, to ask questions and, uh, and get involved. So I think that's everything. That's all the housekeeping stuff. So um, just to introduce uh, Dr. Hannah Gore. So Hannah's been uh, working in the industry for around uh, 20 years now, um, and both across face-to-face, -face, uh, online, and blended. And um, what I've learned about Hannah in preparation for this session and knowing her a little bit before is Hannah is very precise, uh, which I really, uh, I really respect, I really like. So she's precise in her, in her thinking. She's precise in her... Uh, communications. Um, she's precise in her preparation uh, for things. So um, she's got some brilliant thoughts, brilliant insights to share with us, particularly on uh, what this global pandemic, what COVID-19 means to us as an industry, What's what may stay the same, what's going to need to change um, and how we need to change as well. Um, so some really wonderful stuff there. So um, Hannah, I'm going to hand over to you now. I'll move on to the uh, present uh, layout. And Hannah, if you're ready, we're, uh, we're ready for you. I'm ready. Uh, hopefully the screen should start loading up for you guys. Uh, so as Rob said, I'm Dr. Hannah Gore. Um, I have spent the last 20 years in learning and development. Uh, first five were spent face-to-face, -face, and the last 15 in blended and online. I talk really fast so I can get everything packed in as quick as possible to leave as much time as possible at the end to have a really good, meaty Q&A session. So, um, for the tweeters in the room, I am uh, HR Gore, G-O-R-E, like Al Gore, just no Air Force One, and I will be picking up questions here, and if anyone wants to drop me any questions, they can socially stalk me through Twitter, LinkedIn, or on the company website. So, I'm just waiting for my slides, they're still thinking about popping up. Um, luckily, I know my own slide deck. Um, so, to Bring us into the world today. Can everyone see the slides okay? That is the most important thing. I can see someone said my sound is not clear. Everyone else can see my slides but me. This will be an interesting presentation then. I'm going to hopefully skip forward on the slides and you'll be able to see everything. So Hannah, yeah? Hannah, if you want, I can, I can drive the slides for you. Um, yeah, if, if, if you want me to. Kind of it my end. That would be wonderful. Okay, so... That's my title slide done and dusted. So in the next slide, um, as we all know, unless we've been underneath a rock for the last couple of months, which in hindsight is probably the safest place to be, we are in the midst of a massive global pandemic. And what is quite interesting is the speed at which evolution has had to occur as a result. Now evolution, for those people out there that love a bit of biology, normally occurs over successive generations and it rarely happens overnight. But because of COVID, 
we're now in this pandemic situation in which learning and development has rapidly, and I mean rapidly, had to evolve overnight across sectors of industry. So if we flip over to the next slide. So our world is currently closed and trying to reopen, and it's a very strange place to be in. But that does not mean that our evolution is complete. It doesn't mean that we have stopped in any way, shape, or form. And in actual fact, I believe that for us to get to what many have called the new normal, we have to go through three stages to get to what we now uh, will have as the new normal. Rob, on to the next slide. So phase one is known as what I call the sticking plaster. And um, oh, Brendan has said the slides are still not available. Rob, can everyone else see the slides? I've got some people saying they can see the slides, and some people saying that they can't see the slides. So yeah. that is a, I, think I, can I will say, talk, I can to be fair, that, most of my slides are pretty pictures, so I continue on. Yeah. So the first stage that we have is what's known as the sticking plaster. And understandably, this stage happened exceptionally fast. In many countries around the world, we were told about our lockdowns overnight. So understandably, for safety, L&D had to move from the face-to-face -face offering that most people have into online. And there wasn't enough time to think it through strategically or come up with a massive brilliant plan and massive kudos to anybody who had to go through this experience of moving their face to face online because it is not an easy feat in any way shape or form. But now we have to start thinking about how to move to that goal strategically. For a lot of us this has meant that we put PowerPoints and notes up onto a SharePoint system or put them into a folder structure and call it online learning. Now that's a lot of repositories online. It is not necessary there on my slides, I'm so happy to see them. Um, it is not necessarily learning online. There are two very different things between learning online and online learning. And what we have to think about here is the engagement factor and the two different types of online learning versus learning online uh, have very different engagement outcomes. And my slides are still frozen on my slides, so I want to keep on going because I like to know what they look like. So whilst the movement to online as a practitioner academic, I'm very excited about because having worked in online for so long, it's really good to see people getting online, finding all the different tools that are online, talking about different methods of online learning. Now my slides are going too fast on my side. Um, but it, it's good to see that, that there is actually that discussion there. And hopefully you're all going to see some empty seats, I'm really hoping. But that evolution has come at a cost. And in this situation, a repository is not a good learning experience. So I particularly, my passion is learning experience, how people are feeling when they're actually learning online. Because how you feel when you're learning is everything to do with learning motivation. And when you put lots of content up on SharePoint, you're not giving a cohesive learning experience. It feels like the early LMSs of anyone that was working in online learning about 15 years ago. It's that kind of feel. They're difficult to navigate. You don't know how to progressively learn. You don't know which topics go with which. You don't know how to develop a soft skills suite. In essence, it's just not that captivating. If anyone has ever worked in a SharePoint system, then you know trying to just find a regular document, never mind your personal development, is actually really complicated to do. And so this is the situation that we're in right now. And the phase that we're then be moving into is the what now. And everyone thinks now that we've got everything up online, then we must be into the what now. And the truth is, actually, we're not actually there yet. Some companies will get there in the next couple of months, this summer. But the reason why it's not started sooner and didn't start the moment that everything went up online is due to the fact that many companies are still working in this strange limbo that we all seem to be finding ourselves in. And there's also part of us, and it's all part of human behavior, that is hoping that we're going to still be there. January 2020 is going to come back to us in just a couple of months. But I just don't think that's possible. And it all comes down to logistics. And the logistics are that when we return back to a form of normality, whether that be split shift, part working from home, part working in the office, um, different people working in different parts of a warehouse, for example, the problems that schools are currently experiencing, and we can learn a lot from them, in socially distanced classrooms are the same problems that we're going to face in socially distanced L&D workshops. So how, if you are a face-to-face -face workshop person, 
how are we then going to do it? Now, the answer simply normally is we all have smaller workshops. Fine, not a problem. But that can sometimes be ineffective because we've designed that workshop to work for 30 people, the mass all together bringing of conversation, the bringing together of the chat, the breakout groups, the different points of view, bearing in mind different people's responses towards learning and if they're intrinsic, extrinsic, extrovert, introvert. There's a lot to take into account. If you accidentally turn up in a room full of five introverted people, that's going to be a very hard workshop to work with, just as much as you're going to have five extroverted people. So you have to think about that. And there's also a cost implication. You can't run that same workshop six times. And let's be honest, anyone who's done a repeat presentation or workshop, you present it differently every single time. So people are going to have a different feel to how they've learned compared to somebody else. And we're in a massive state of economic flux. And we just can't afford it. So the situation then becomes, well, how do we then actually design? And um, Rob will be dropping in links as well to some um, blog pieces that are done for uh, further reading. So the problem is that the sticking plaster that we applied is short term. Glue only lasts for so long. And online repositories of content can only last for so long. Companies are changing. We have to be changing as a result. And so we have to enter into a new world. Plants can't grow, basically, if you pop them wrong. Believe me, I have tried. Um, I'm sometimes a very good gardener. I'm sometimes a very bad gardener. And I'm actually talking about my garden here and not my L&D. But we have to think about how we're actually now shaping the future. Because good L&D can make a company, and bad L&D can break a company. And we have to be really considerate about our place. And so our place now is to think about the what now, now, before your boss is asking about it. And the reason why we have to do it is we have to prepare not only our strategy, not only our plans, but also ourselves. So we have to prepare ourselves, develop ourselves, advance ourselves, and have a different outlook. So I've worked with a lot of professionals over the last 20 years. Very, very few of them work or have been trained in actual learning or instructional design. And that is strategically now more important than ever before, how we actually bring forward our learning design, our science, our craft into this new world. So we have to be thinking about adapting what we have for its new purpose. And that's where learning design comes in and it's very important. Uh, it produces much more productive content as a result. So thinking about learning design is thinking about how we can actually bring it forward. Because in having good learning design and having a, a learning design background, you can take what you have in the face-to-face -face content and you can start mixing it into the online repository, turning it into an online blended development. And instead of having a type or style or learning outcomes, you can start actually crafting what you have and what you know and what you need to have for your company into a new kind of mixing pot. And for companies, it's really beneficial to look at the rise of what's known as split classrooms. Now, split classrooms is something that I did for the last uh, company that I was working with for the last two years. And uh, Rob will be dropping in a blog piece to unpack that further for you guys, because I'm going to give a really quick overview. But split classrooms allow companies to address the issues of smaller face-to-face -face workshops up front whilst providing practical skills. So what happens is uh, participants learn online first in a asynchronous manner at their own pace. And then when they've completed the online learning, they progress through to a face-to-face -face workshop. That can then be a smaller number. So that solves the numbers issue. It also allows learners to come in and have the same level of understanding, which means facilitators can actually work and get to grips with the actual uh, problem scenarios, outcomes that they actually want to address. It means that you can have better, richer role-playing situations. It means that you can actually bring an asset into a workshop and actually develop it. It means that you can practice the skills that you're actually learning online in a real-life environment in a much richer and deeper way than you would in a face-to-face -face therapy environment. So there are methods to do with online learning that you can actually develop that can actually work better in a pandemic situation. I did not realize I was prepping myself for a pandemic two years ago, but flip classrooms helped enormously. And I ran flip classrooms for a company that had 37 country, companies in 93 countries. And in lots of different time zones and lots of different clients that they worked with. And as a method, if you design it correctly, it works beautifully. And then that can bring you then into the phase of the new normal. 
because as much as I'd love the world to turn back to January 2020, it still won't. And, and we will have learned and we will have developed. And what 2021 will look like will absolutely depend on how we've developed this year. So our development in 2021 is absolutely based on our development of 2020. So we will evolve in a different way as a result. And we have to think about our evolution towards our company's evolution. And that will help pull us forward into a much more competitive position and help companies in the way that they are operating. Because as much as I would love, as I said, our world to turn back to normal, I don't think it will. I think we will come out of this slightly changed. There will be senses of normality, but also as well, you know, face-to-face -face working environments will change. Um, companies may not necessarily sign off on three-day conferences anymore, three-day workshops, or work in the same way. They will not necessarily need a, a member of staff to come out of the company for a whole day to do learning in a classroom because we're having to be much more responsive to maintain our market share than ever before. So unless, you know, unless we, uh, this virus stamps out tomorrow, I actually genuinely don't think that is going to be happening and we will be moving forward into a different time. And at the end of the day, the glue on these post-it notes will last as long, I think, and as to our beliefs as to what's going to actually move forward. And we have to be prepping ourselves for a much more longer term goal. But here's the great part. Uh, it's not all doom and gloom. We get to wipe the slate clean. And that is a massively powerful construct. If you think about it as a challenge and as something that can be done, no legacy systems, no legacy people, no, this is the way we've always done it. The pandemic allows us to start again. The pandemic allows us to write a new strategy. The pandemic allows us to address our learning and development in a completely new strategy, in a completely new way, and develop it towards our business leaders. And I wrote a blog piece about four steps that you can take, nice to have, need to have, um, to become much better positioned inside your company, to bring yourself and your company forward based on a clean slate. So we have to be taking this as a golden opportunity. When I joined Solera two years ago, the previous company I was working with before the pandemic, I was told there was no L&D function. Now, that sounds really scary, but I just went, amazing, no legacy. You know, I get to create something really great. I get to work with people to create something that's actually going to work, rather than sticking plasters, building things on top of things. We can just go, okay, let's start afresh. What does it look like? So in some ways, for us, this is the golden opportunity, and we have a wealth of knowledge out there. It's not like we're doing this alone. Everybody's in this together. Uh, we've got 15, 20 years of documents and podcasts and interviews. We've all got Twitter. We've got networks. We've got LinkedIn. We've got people that are sitting here in this room right now that know all about online and blended learning, that know all about this world, and they put their hand up. And all the people that do not understand this world, that are used to face-to-face, -face, they can put their hand up. Because at the end of the day, if we do not develop ourselves individually, we cannot develop as an industry. So we have to be ready for this, and we have to bring this forward. And so there are seeds. Um, anyone who's listening to podcasts right now, partaking in this conference, we're all talking about new growth, new ways, the evolution that we're now actually in has already begun. And we can grow with this 110% and create something really new and really fantastic. And in a year's time, do we look back and say, this is the greatest opportunity we ever had? Or do we look back and go, we didn't change? And so a really clever man, long before my time, in the 1800s, wrote this line. And he said, basically, it is really a survival of the fittest, that we have to evolve, that those that don't evolve are finally extinct. Now, I don't want my companies that I work with to become extinct. I don't want my industry that I work in to become extinct. I don't want the people that I work with to become extinct. And so we have to all help each other in our learning to bring our industry forward, to start looking at learning design, to start looking at how learner engagement will actually work in this new world, wipe the slate clean, and start over again. And I think... You know, look back in a year's time, and yes, this is not going to be an easy year, and we can chalk it up to one of the most difficult periods of our lives, 
but it could actually be the greatest period of our life. And that's really where I want to open it up for questions and discussion so we can actually you know, talk about how we're actually going to bring this forward, what problems people have, what bottlenecks they have, and where we all need support. And so I'm going to throw it open to everybody for questions, and I can see both screens are running at the same time with questions, and Rob's going to help me out here as well. So if anyone doesn't want to yeah, post a well, question here, they can yeah, find me at my website on LinkedIn. Um, my blogs are on my personal website. You can find me on Twitter. You can socially stalk me if you want to chat to me outside the room. But I really want to take this opportunity to throw it open and have a really good debate here. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Hannah. So I've been monitoring uh, all the questions coming in. Hi, so there are a few questions around flipped learning. So can you, uh -huh. flipped classroom. So can you tell us a bit more about that? Just describe that a bit more for those that aren't, aren't familiar with it. Okay, so flipped classroom, in the easiest way I can describe it, is we've all been in a situation where we've been identified to do training. Presentation training is the example I normally give because nine times out of ten we've all been in that situation. So normally your boss says you need to work on your presentation skills and off you trot it down the corridor and you sit in the room and someone's going to present to you about how to present. And this is possibly the worst way to actually learn about soft skills. It's somebody to tell you how to do it. Soft skills are developed out of actually doing. And so you doodle on your little pad or you doodle on the handout. You come back, you chuck it in your drawer and you carry on with your life. And all of us have been in that kind of workshop scenario at some point in our lives. And six months could go by, and you've got to create a presentation. And so you get out your slides, you look at your doodles of that plant, of your name, of anything else, clouds normally. Um, and you sit down and go, oh, how do I write a presentation? And you try to remember, and you cobble it together, and you gave the presentation, and your boss turns around and went, I thought you did the training. Like half an hour, a day, half a day in a room with somebody else talking at you can make you a guru. And it can't. Learning by rote only works for times table. And that's just, I mean, I can do my times table because I learned on the way to school in a cassette, that's how old I am, in a car on the way to school. And that's the only thing I've ever learned by rote. Everything else we learn by doing. Now take that example and flip it. So instead, you have a course about the art of presenting, the narrative, how to build a storyboard, the peaks and troughs, how to use imagery, how to actually present yourself. I know, for example, I wave my hands around a lot, and I normally work this to my advantage inside a presentation room. I work my energy I have to the benefit of the presentation, et cetera, et cetera. So you're learning how to build a presentation. During the course, you are building a presentation. You then present that to your line manager. To me, that is crucially important because they need to see how you're presenting. It is not good enough for a manager to send you off to a room. That does not make them a good manager. They need to see your development. And we as L&D people have to encourage that. I am in socialist L&D blog post that Rob has dropped in. I've explained that in there as well. You then take the presentation into the workshop, and you right. work through that presentation in the workshop. So you are presenting to other people. You are getting feedback, real-time responses with this client. I did that. I like that slide, but if you move it around, how about this? How about you introduce it in another way? And you come out of that presentation workshop with a presentation that you know how to present, that you've had real-time feedback on. And then you look at that in comparison to your doodled notes that sit and gather dust inside the drawer, and they are poles apart in learning, and they are poles apart in outcome. So Flip Classroom works beautifully for soft skills. And also as well, if you look at the work by Khan Academy, and this goes back to 2010, 2012, uh, Khan Academy is perfectly used for flip classroom. It's primarily math skills, but they've actually developed into other subjects. And what happens is the kids learn about the concept of simultaneous equations at home using guide-by-side videos created by Khan Academy, and they go into the classroom, which is how it actually began as a concept, and they do their homework inside the classroom, and they get real-time feedback from their teacher. Which student do you think is going to do better at the end of that school year? The one that does it at home and doesn't understand it and gets it marked right or wrong, or the one that's actually working through the problems with the teacher? And so flipped classroom in this respect could work really well, makes you much more dynamic, but also it allows for the smaller classrooms to take place with the richer learning. I hope that helps answer the difference. Blended and flipped. Blended is a form of flip, but flip doesn't necessarily 
always mean blended. Blended can mean face-to-face, -face, but you're not actually bringing through the skills. You're actually learning something else. That is just a face-to-face -face part component and an online component. What I'm saying is bring the online component and learning and skills through. And what we used to call in my uh, last company I was working with, drilling, practicing them in the actual workshop. That's flip classroom. So we've got a brilliant question uh, from Kemi. Uh, so Hannah, what, in your opinion, are the top practical three things we need to do now okay, to prepare so, for 2020? Uh, I actually, the, one of the blog posts that Rob's dropped in, I actually came up with four things. Um, and they were, and I've got to ramble them now off the top of my head, which is pretty impressive. The first thing we have to do is we have to look at ourselves. 110%. We're at the front of the queue. And that sounds crazy in the world of R&D because we automatically think about our company and our people. But we have to think about ourselves. What do we need to be in 2021? What do we need to drive our company forward? The next thing you need to do is develop your communication skills, your marketing skills, your negotiation skills, not just your L&D knowledge. We as L&D people have fantastic L&D knowledge. I'm never going to deny that. But we're not necessarily savvy salespeople when it comes to our craft. So we need to build our communication and sales business skills because we have to persuade, influence um, people round to our point of view as to what L&D should actually look like. Thirdly, you get yourself a copy of your company's plan. Now, your five-year plan may be in the bin right now because of the changes with COVID, depending on your industry. Find out what your next 12, 24 months looks like for your company. If they now have a new five-year plan, fantastic. Start looking at those forecasts and seeing where you can help. By having conversations through using your communication skills with business managers, you will know the current temperature inside your company. You need to know where the skills gaps lie. And then you look at your five-year business plan, and then you go, here are the gaps. Here are the gaps. I can see where they are, and I can see where I, L&D, can address them. And then using those three key stages, you go through to your HR director, that who leads your particular department, your L&D director, if you've got one of those, your CEO, if you really want to, and sit them down and say, look, here's the deal. This is our current state of play. This is the current situation in the outside world. This is where you want us to get to, and this is how we're going to do it. A company that cares about the talent inside a company and developing it for the greater good of the company, and the bottom line does help with that greater good, is a much nicer company for a HR director or a CEO to recruit into. So it is for their benefit, not only for the bottom line, but for future talent coming in. So those are the four key steps I would say. Look at yourself, develop yourself. Have conversations with lots of business managers in and around your company. Get to know what their problems are. Go to your five-year plan, your 12-month plan, your 24-month plan, whatever plan that company has right now. If you haven't got it, can't find it, someone's going to say something somewhere. Start mapping out the gaps and then work your way to the top to talk about how L&D can address those gaps. Because as I said in the presentation, good L&D can make a company, bad L&D can break a company. If we are not ready, if we're not poised for 2021, we will not survive till 2021. I hope that helps answer. Yeah, I think that's okay. A great, a great quote. Um, and a, a lovely uh, question as well from uh, James Della. So um, his biggest challenge is around digital literacy for some of his learners. Yeah. Any strategies digital to overcome Digital literacy has been the biggest soft skills gap I think every single company has seen in this pandemic. And sometimes digital skills can come out of fear, afraid of doing wrong, afraid of looking bad, afraid of not being able to keep up, comfort. Being in the comfort zone, I like a face-to-face. -face. It gives me a day out of the office. I like a face-to-face -face because I'm a people person. I'm a definite people person. And so you have to understand where the root of the fear is coming from towards digital literacy to address that fear. It is not a blanket answer for everybody. It's not the same. They don't have the skills. It's, okay, what skills do you have and how can we translate them through to the world of online and then build on them? And that's really important. It's not just you don't have them or you do have them. Everybody has skills. We just need to know how to translate them and then build on them. 
I find that really interesting when there's lots of um, face-to-face trainers at the moment that feel they need to embrace this completely new, foreign, different thing that, that they have no experience in. And what I always explain to them is, you're a trainer. Cool. You already do this. <laughs> and designing great learning experiences, is, it's, yeah. you, this is what you, you do for your living. You're just adding Absolutely. a few more tools and, to and it. And one of the things branches. with an online learner, especially um, if you're doing webinars, and you're worried about how you're going to appear on screen, record yourself privately. Watch it back. You know, understand how you work mm. online, how you work in front of a camera, helps enormously in then delivering webinars. It builds your confidence. Mm. Um, and there was a question. Uh, let me just check. Um, so, how do we how do we design behavioural training um, in online? Okay, modes behavioural training is complex because it requires blended. You can't fully learn behavioral training online. You have to have a blended experience. So for example, you can uh, use the online learning in the same way that you do the presentation training, the science of behavioral. And then you use your face-to-face. Now, you don't have to have all the learning and then some face-to-face, whether that be by webinar or whether that by the actual one day physical face-to-face. You can have learning cycles. They can learn a bit, face-to-face a bit, learn a bit, face-to-face a bit. And this is a really good way of drilling down behavioral um, in the same way that you can unpack problems, but also unearth um, behaviors, patterns, understanding. So don't see it as they've got to do all this learning online and then we get to the sexy face-to-face time. They can have a bit of learning, a, a bit of face-to-face, build on that learning, more face-to-face, build on that learning, more face-to-face. And it is in chunks. And in uh, our world, we call those learning cycles. So you just put them through several cycles. So they learn the science, and then they work through it in a face-to-face environment. It is possible, but I would say don't do it solely online, because behavioral work is a soft skill. Behavioral knowledge and behavioral courses work best when you're talking it through. So don't go completely cold. Really do build in that face-to-face in, a, in whatever form you want to. Wonderful. And a, a little bit of a challenge here from David. So uh, given the experience over the last three months, uh, why do we need to go back to face-to-face at all? We do. Um, we're human beings uh, that we do like each other's company. And there are, I mean, if, for example, you're an extrinsically motivated person, I am one of these people, um, I feed off other people on a man path. I feed off other people's energy, their feedback, how they react to how I'm presenting or how uh, they react to what I'm saying inside a workshop. And we will never be in a situation where we're completely devoid of human contact. So we have to learn with human contact. I'm not saying tomorrow, say the pandemic ended tomorrow, no, it's all clear and we didn't need the vaccine and it's just magically died out. I don't think it's wise to go back completely to where we were before. But I think a hybrid moving forward will benefit us in the long term. So I do still think we need a face-to-face. It really helps reinforce learning. When you're practicing soft skills, for example, like presentation skills, if you're practicing knowledge, do I understand this correctly? If I'm able to hold a debate. So for example, if I take a finance book and I read it cover to cover, does that make me an accountant? It really doesn't. In understanding and explaining problems and talking them through, do we get a deeper level of understanding? Does it move from different parts of the brain so we actually memorize it for longer and becomes part of our way of life? So we're not going to go back fully, but a hybrid would be great. Mm. And uh, a great question from Nina Lazarus here. So what role uh, does or can self-directed learning play? And how do we sell the okay, new approaches so self-directed to Self-directed learning can be complicated. In, it depends on the type of learner that's actually learning it. If you're extrinsically motivated versus intrinsically motivated people, They address it in different ways. Self-directed learning is beautiful on the fact of it is bite-sized. And that is really important in our fast-paced world. We need to have learning that is bite-sized just in time. Stop thinking about things that are three-day face-to-face workshops. We'll do a three-day webinar. Don't do that. Three-day workshops will turn it into a 20-hour course. Don't do that. No one's going to sit there and learn for 20 hours. But you will learn in chunks. And you have to learn, this is where the learning design part comes in, how to actually build one chunk onto another, onto another, onto another. And so 
um, in designing it, the self-directed learning is selling the benefits of the learning, not the learning itself. So you can have content that's easily available, get to the mm. bit that you actually need, learn the part that is actually going to improve you, test the bit that works best for you um, to build on your skills. There's nothing worse, and everybody's been there, that was sat through an entire workshop for a whole day, and there's been half an hour that has been the thing that you didn't know. Get directly to the thing that you know. Self-directed learning, if chunked up appropriately, can be personalized learning. And we need personalized learning to address the soft skills gap between different people. Some people are on different level playing fields in that their knowledge is different to others. So we can address it, chunk it up, and they can get the bit that they need when they need it. And that just-in-time, fast-paced learning approach is where we need to be at because this pandemic has shown we have to move rapidly. And that's where selling the benefits of self-directed learning, not the learning itself, will be beneficial for that learner. So that was a wonderful segue to the next question as well. So from Jason Louise Graham, uh, was asking about, um, do, you, do you know of any tools for uh, question asking, for measuring gaps, so mm. those sort of performance gaps that you mentioned, tools that will enable organisations yeah. to diagnose those? Tools are available out there and companies approaches. are available out there that will sell them. Um, and I have nothing against them, except for your problems are within your company and they're different to somebody else's. So if you take everybody, then um, it's not necessarily going to work for one. One size does not fit all. Every single soft skills gap analysis I've ever done within any company or client that I've worked with, I've developed for that client. There is always base questions that you will find, and if you Google online, you'll find a plethora of them. Uh, they're very readily available in that respect. But talk, and this comes back to the stage two of the four things you have to do, talk to the business managers understand where the gaps are from them and start addressing those questions. Different departments will have different gaps. And so if you buy an offer peg, it will not work for every single department. So you have to personalize it in that respect. And that does take a little bit more work in the beginning, but reaps the benefits in the long run. So absolutely, there are templates out there, different companies, and they don't necessarily tell you all about them online, but you can get a good sense of them, and I can talk you through them outside of this because I'm very conscious of time to start reeling off the types of questions that you will need. But there are questions out there, however, do add in personalized ones for your company on top, otherwise you'll never get to the bottom of the problem. And there's a, a couple of closely related questions come through about uh, mm. virtual classroom and webinar delivery and what kind of session length is, is kind of optimal. Yeah, that's, or a, that's should, a hard one for. because it really depends on the design of the webinar within. So, for example, if you've got a webinar in which somebody is talking to you constantly, which is why I talk really fast and then lead it over to questions to get the audience more engaged and actually answer the problems that you're coming with, if you're constantly talking, they will last 10 minutes before they start to switch off. That is really hard. If you've loaded up a webinar and it has 120 slides and they see that in the bottom corner, their heart will sink. So I would say if you, if you have to have a four hours, it has to be four hours or it has to be two hours, and that's what you have to do, then you have to build in activities. Understand a bit, do a bit, practice a bit. Um, have audience interaction. There's a great product out there called Mentimeter. I particularly love it. It has open slides and it also has slidings uh, for um, responses, but it also has word clouds. And you can use that in the same way that you would in a workshop setting. And you say, um, what are the key blockers in this organization for support? And people can be typing in their responses. If they see another response they agree with, they type in the exact same word and the word gets bigger and bigger. And then as a facilitator, you can pick out key things a hell of a lot quicker and get to the base of the problem. And so when you're designing, do not talk at them all that time. Have learner interaction. Have breakout groups. Importantly, write in wellness breaks. Write in comfort breaks. Um, it is nothing worse than when you're talking or when you're listening to, to keep your, um, you know, your mind not on your bladder, your mind not on I really need a cup of tea or a little snack put them in. Also, it's a golden opportunity, and there's been another session about it with Fiona McBride about yoga, breathing. So I've just written a set of webinars for a client, and every hour and a half, they do some yoga stretching. And it's not like, you know, 
full on yoga, it is just breathing in and out, understanding your presence inside the room and resetting your brain. So you have to build these things in because it is really tiring being online that long and everyone's attention spans are much shorter. So consider multimedia assets, consider activities, consider time away, consider personal reflective logs where they've got half an hour away from the screen but they're working on something in a hard copy that you can provide in a PDF or an ePDF or an old-fashioned notebook and pen. Have wellness sections broken into it. Really don't put it as the big chunks that you would in a face-to-face -face workshop. We need to walk away from those one-hour-long sessions because they're exhausting and you don't learn. And if you ask them at the end what your key take-home from that, they can't tell you everything you just taught them. So, so build them in, design them in, and the best way to know it is sit down on your worst possible day that you do not want to do it and go through it yourself in real time and tell me if it was any good. And if you can sit there for four hours and take that, that's great. But most people can't. So practice it yourself. Don't just look through the deck and go, oh, that seems fine. But really go through it. Do all the activities yourself. Do all the slides yourself. Watch all the videos that you've dropped in and the activities. And then go, was this a good idea? Should I put in? And really feel the experience that you're actually developing. Don't just write it and present it. Mm. Preparation, preparation, preparation. Mm. Um, so a, a question here from uh, Robin that came in earlier. And um, so what are the issues with wiping the slate clean? So we've got a bit of an opportunity to do a reset here, but, but what are the yeah. risks it's always and the issues? Fear. fear of losing out of stuff we've already got. It's the comfort blanket. It's the security. It's like taking off your stabilizers off a bike for the first time when you're a kid, you know? Um, and going, what if I fall over? What if it all goes horribly wrong? What if I break my leg? What happens if I graze myself? What happens if I look like an idiot to my boss? You know, we're in a very experimental time. We're in a time where everything's in flux. And we have to say we're going to do the best we can in this environment. But that involves walking away from a large section of what it is we did previously, take all the good bits, and weave it into something better. You know, there's a lot of L&D. If we look at our catalogue, curriculums online, whatever it is that you talk about, repositories, a lot of it is out of date, doesn't get used, isn't that good. Like, delete it. Just get rid of it. Put it in an archive and go, okay, what is it we do need? And again, it's about selling the benefits. This is where business skills come in no end. My first job um, in the world 20 years ago was helping people sell products better. Once you understand how to sell, build rapport, build communication, build networks, sell the benefits, address the pain points, these are all business terms, it helps a lot. So you have to have those skills to develop it and then sell the benefits. Yes, boss, I know we did that before, but in this new world, to get our company to survive and thrive, we're going to do the following. You know, and that takes a lot of guts. I get that. But that's where we're wiping yeah. the slate green and going, okay, let's go for this you know, and start over. And you can create great things. A lot of companies have started over making different products now than they used to before. They're, um, we're all thinking differently. So why does L&D have to stay where it was 10 years ago? It's the, the shove that perhaps, uh, you know, some people have needed uh, to, to make some pretty major changes. Um, there was a question uh, that was in, I've lost it for now, but the gist, gist of it was, you know, what do you think about using mm. uh, gamification techniques and competition to kind of encourage yeah, learning? Yeah, so I, I am a fan of gamification to an extent. Gamification, and there's a blog piece on my personal blog, drhanagor.com, about this if you dig that far enough. Um, gamification is great for building motivation, but you have to be really careful with it. A lot of people can become quite competitive. If you're always seeing the same people at the top of the leaderboard, you ain't even going to have a try, you know, because you're thinking, God, they're always at the top. They're always the best. I'm never going to get picked for sports. If you're that person or have the people inside your organization that were never picked for sports at school, they will naturally hate gamification because they see it as a competition. Now, the way to work gamification is not to make people competitive against each other. It's to make them competitive within themselves. So I'm competitive as a person. Everybody knows this about me, but I'm competitive with myself. I have to be better than I was yesterday. I have to 
to learn something new today that I didn't know yesterday. I could perform something better than I did yesterday. It doesn't matter if it's incremental or on a large scale. It just has to be I am better than I was yesterday. So if you turn gamification inward personalized learning rather than mass learning, the person is going to become better than they were yesterday. They're getting those goals for themselves. They're getting those awards for themselves. And it's private. And that will help them, encourage them more. If they're extrinsically motivated, they're getting the same rewards. If they're intrinsically motivated, they're not getting put off by the star leaders of the group. So, so when you're thinking about gamification, think about everybody who's going to hate it, not necessarily everyone who's going to love it, and address those issues in. Because it's about creating stuff that works for the many, not the few. Yeah, it's not great if you're in that bottom twenty-five percent, twenty percent, is it? Yeah, it's not not that motivating. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I'm I'm afraid everybody, we're going to have to call a halt to it there. There were so many brilliant questions, and thank you, Hannah, for all of your uh, your thoughtful, insightful, and, and thought-provoking uh, answers as well. Um, if we're very lucky, Hannah may be able to answer a few more of the questions on LinkedIn over yeah, coming days yeah, and if weeks. Anyone if wants uh, to copy and paste okay. their question? and bombard me either, you can find me by email on my company website or my personal website. Um, links should be there for Canterbury Consultant, the Canterbury Consultant to group.com or drhannagore.com or drhannagore on LinkedIn or hrgore on Twitter or just Google me and track me down. Absolutely more than happy to go into more depth and unpack those kinds of problems for you because at the end of the day, we're all in it together. So we have to help each other out. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Hannah. It's been absolutely brilliant today. I've uh, really made me think. I've learned loads. So, uh, And I can see the audience have, have loved it as well. So thanks so much, everybody. Thanks for your participation, your great questions, your great answers, your great insights. Um, it's really made uh, the session wonderful. So thanks all, and enjoy uh, whatever next session you're on to. Enjoy the balance of your day. Have a great day, everyone.